Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on this inaugural episode of The Homestead Journey, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I will be your host. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on this journey. So what is the Homestead Journey podcast? The first thing I plan to do on this podcast is share with you a part of our journey here on our homestead in beautiful upstate New York as we journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Secondly, I hope to inspire people who maybe haven't yet made the decision to begin raising and growing their own food to join us on the journey. The third thing I plan to do is to encourage those who are already on the homesteading journey to encourage them to keep going and to provide them with maybe tools, information, uh, tips and tricks that may help them be more successful in the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My final goal for this podcast is to develop community. Now, admittedly, with this type of format, that may be a bit difficult because, generally speaking, podcasts are seen more as a monologue. But my goal is to somehow turn this into a dialogue. You see, I don't claim to be an expert in homesteading. I don't claim to be an expert really in anything in life. Um, but I am someone who does have a passion for sharing with people what I have learned over the years and I'm still on a journey of learning myself, and so my goal is to learn from you. As I said at the beginning, this podcast is dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, and many times one might look at those as very selfish and self-centered goals, but I think within homesteading, it's very important to remember our interdependence on each other, and that we need community, that we need to be able to learn from each other, that we need mentors that can pass on skill sets that can inspire us. And so hopefully this podcast will help develop and foster that sense of community and interdependence. So what can you expect from the Homestead Journey podcast? Initially, my plan is to release content weekly. Um, as things progress, I have some ideas with regards to doing interviews with other homesteaders, um, perhaps doing a live call-in show. We'll see how things progress, but at least initially my goal is to release content on a weekly basis. As we launch this podcast, the content will be broken down initially into four uh, major components. First of all, Homestead Happenings, where I share with you our journey that week on our homestead. It may be a, a success, a failure, um, but uh, it will be a part of our journey, a window into what is happening here on 3B Farm and Homestead. The second component will be a segment I'm entitling Community Corner, and that will be a segment dedicated to things that are taking place in the broader homesteading community, whether it's an, an event that's taken place or a video um, that I found helpful. Maybe it's a magazine that's arrived or a book that I'm reading, but something that pertains to the broader homesteading community. The third component of uh, our content each week will be something that I'm entitling Charting the Course, and that really will be the bulk of the episode. Um, they will be ruminations and reflections, uh, perhaps, or maybe it will be a how-to, or it could even be a rant, but uh, it will be homestead-related topics um, that hopefully will help people on their journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And then rounding out the show every week will be a homestead hack, something that I have found helpful that we use on our homestead and that will hopefully uh, help you on your journey as well. So having said all of that, by way of introduction, let's jump right into the first episode and let's begin the first ever Homestead Happenings. So this week on our homestead, really not a lot's going on, which it's, it, this is kind of an odd time probably to launch a 
homestead podcast because here on our homestead really things are starting to slow down we are starting to um, clean up and uh, get ready for winter uh, this week I did a lot of garden cleanup we have raised beds um, and so I've been cleaning them out uh, we were selling vegetables and a roadside vegetable stand and so this week I brought that back from the side of the road and stored it for the winter and we are also in the process of prepping for a new Ruth Stout uh, garden we've never done in ground so to speak gardening here on this property and I'll share with you more about our gardening methods as we go along um, and the reason why we haven't done any kind of traditional in-ground gardening but uh, next year I am planning on trying out the Ruth Stout gardening method and so I'm in the process of using some geese and ducks to kind of clear an area um, where I will then put down some compost put down some hay and uh, prep that for planting in the spring I also uh, was able to score a an all-american 921 canner this week I had found it on uh, on Facebook marketplace a couple of weeks ago had sent it to my mom who does a lot of canning um, but my mom only has a four quart canner and so I wasn't sure whether or not she might want something that was a little bit larger so that she could uh, do a lot more canning more quickly and she declined because they do have a glass top stove and it was really really a great price um, and so on Saturday we were up in the area where this canner was located it was about an hour away from us but we happened to be up that way because my son was in a concert and so I stopped by picked that canner up but it was really great because not only uh, did I score a beautiful canner but I was able to chat with this gentleman uh, about kind of what he had done um, when he was using it how he had raised vegetables and had a had a garden and had done farmers markets and and things like that and so it's always neat when you have the opportunity to make connections with other people who understand what you're doing who understand why you're doing it and uh, you can have those conversations he had never canned meat before and I was sharing with him about how we can meat and he found that very fascinating and uh, so it was just overall a really really great conversation and this canner it, it looks mint um, he bought it I think about 15 years ago he used it for three seasons and then he put it away and didn't use it anymore and so he finally was like well I need to get rid of it and so he was so very excited that it was going to a home where it will be well loved and well used and uh, the other thing that was kind of funny is he uh, went to open up the box and explain to me how the canner worked and I said well I have a 930 so and he was like oh then you don't need to you don't need to know that um, I really was on the fence about buying this canner because I do have a 930 um, when I was initially looking for an all-american I wanted a 921 and I happened to find a 930 at an antiques uh, sale and so I picked it up for I think 60 bucks it was an old style one that had a pet cock in it and I wanted to put a jiggler on it so I ordered the pipe the vent pipe and the jiggler and when I went to install it into the into the lid I cross threaded the vent pipe and so I ruined the lid so I had to buy another lid so now I'm into my 930 for about 190 bucks which still is a very good price for a 930 um, but when I found this 921 on Facebook for a hundred bucks uh, I just really couldn't pass it up and so now I have a 921 added to the collection very excited about it very honored to own it um, and uh, so not going to be able to use it probably until next season as we have pretty much wrapped up our canning here um, if we do any more canning we'll probably do up some beef and when I do that I my goal is to do enough to do a full load on the 930 which has uh, it, it can hold 14 quarts anyhow but very very happy to have that 921 that was something very exciting that happened here this week another thing that I have going on here on our homestead is I'm doing lacto fermented uh, hot pepper sauce um, this is my first time attempting that in the past I did some pickled peppers using vinegar based recipes and I did do some of that as well this year when I was canning 
but I wanted to try my hand at a lacto-fermented hot pepper sauce. So right now I have, uh, I think, nine or ten different jars uh, sitting around the kitchen as they're fermenting, and probably this coming week I will take those and uh, grind them up and turn them into um, hot pepper sauce. So that's what's been happening here on the homestead this week. Uh, again, we're really slowing things down as we start preparing for winter. My goal this year was to do some raised bed gardening over the winter. I don't think that's going to happen, um, but uh, we'll see. Who knows, maybe in a future episode, I will be providing you with some information on homestead happenings about our winter raised bed gardens. So now on to Community Corner. On this first edition of Community Corner, something very, very interesting happened and very exciting happened to me this week with regards to the broader homestead community. And that is that I had somebody reach out to me via our, they had found us via YouTube and come to find out this individual lives here in our hometown. Um, their YouTube channel, I'll link to it in the show notes, is called Along the River Homestead. And uh, so it was one of those things that uh, it was it was really, really cool to make that kind of a connection. Here it is, we are both producing content here in the same town and yet had never run into each other. And uh, she was able to find me via YouTube and then uh, find our uh, Facebook page. And uh, so we made a connection there. So excited about that. It's one of those things that, um, you know, I get I get very excited when I'm connecting with other homesteaders and people who understand what it is that we're doing, what we're trying to achieve, and who don't look at us as the odd, weird people. Um, and so very excited about uh, getting to know them better. We're going to be visiting each other's homesteads. And uh, so just very excited about that. Another interesting thing that took place this week is I found uh, a some information with regards to some workshops that are being held in the western part of New York State through the Cornell Cooperative Extension Program. Now, Cor Cornell University is located here in New York. You may have heard of it before. It's an Ivy League school that's actually got a very, very solid agricultural uh, program. And throughout New York State are Cornell Cooperative Extension offices. I think they have one in each county, but don't quote me on that. And so this week I was reading, there's, there's a website called morningagclips.com and they have various ag-related news and you can look at it state by state. And so this article happened to pop up on that website this week and I was reading through it and Cornell is hosting a series of what they call leaf workshops with a focus on homesteading. And they're doing things like old-fashioned soap making, growing greens all winter, how to make homemade jams, those kinds of things. And I was very, very excited to, to find out about that. Now, again, this is on the western side of New York, so quite a, quite a ways away from me. But I'm going to be reaching out to my local Cornell Cooperative Extension agent and finding out what can we do to bring something like that to our area since they're already doing it in western New York how can we make that happen on this side of the state but I was very excited to see that there are those kinds of programs being offered here in New York State uh, with that with a focus on homesteading I was very excited to see that if you are in New York State I would recommend that you check it out that you reach out to your local Cornell Cooperative Extension agent in your county but if you aren't located in New York State, you probably have county extension agents as well available through some kind of a university program. And I would highly recommend that you take a look at those because you may be able to find courses like this in your area where you can uh, learn homesteading skills in more of an academic type situation. So that's it for this week's Community Corner. Now on to charting the course. This week's edition of Charting the Course simply is going to be an introduction of who I am and a little bit about our homestead journey up to this point. So again, my name is Brian Wells. 
along with my wife Bonnie and my son Brian Jr. We live on a homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. It's a homestead that's a little over two acres in size that we purchased a little over 10 years ago. And in the last 10 years, we have experimented with a variety of different animal setups, a variety of different gardening methods. We do a lot of canning and we do some fermenting as well. Now, I wish I could tell you that our homestead journey up to this point has been one that has been well ordered, well planned out. Uh, it's been based in permaculture principles, and thus it lends itself well to some kind of a 10-step program whereby I could teach you how to start your own perfect homestead. But that's not our story. You know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos and listen to a lot of homestead-related podcasts, and it seems to me that for many people, there are three scenarios that have led them to homesteading. The first scenario is that uh, they became disenfranchised with chasing the American dream in suburbia or in an urban setting, and so they've left that behind in search of a simpler life, uh, getting back to the land and raising and growing their own food. For some people, it's been health or medical related issues that have led them to homesteading. Maybe they were diagnosed with some kind of a food allergy or they have some kind of a genetic issue and therefore they need to take more control over the food that they eat. The third scenario that I hear most often is that homesteading is the culmination for some people of a lifelong or a childhood dream, a dream of raising animals, raising food, and having a small farm. I will tell you right now, none of those three scenarios even come close to describing our journey into homesteading. If you were to talk to both my family and Bonnie's family, we would be the last ones they ever thought would do something like this. My mom has said over and over and over again, out of her three boys, she never dreamed I would be the one that would do anything like this. As a kid growing up, I was a bit of a bookworm. I didn't like spending a lot of time outdoors. Um, and so again, ask any one of my family, I am the one that they would have voted least likely to have a farm or a homestead. My wife is very, very similar in that regard. In fact, about a month ago, my mother-in-law and father-in-law came up to visit from Pennsylvania. And my father-in-law was telling me that his brother Willie stopped by uh, shortly before they came up to visit. And Uncle Willie said to my father-in-law, Grady, my father-in-law's name is Grady and everybody refers to him as Grady. Uncle Willie said, Grady, did you ever think that prissy Miss Bonnie would grow up to be a farmer's wife? <laughs> so certainly folks, uh, having a homestead has not been the culmination of a lifelong dream for my wife and I. Our homestead journey also isn't rooted in some kind of a medical issue or health-related problem. By and large, we're healthy individuals, and thank God for that. And finally, our story isn't one of us in search of the perfect homestead because we were disenfranchised with the pursuit of the American dream. When we relocated back to this area in 2007, we didn't relocate back to this area because we were looking to get back to the land or to start a homestead. And frankly, when we purchased this land a little over 10 years ago, it wasn't because we were looking to homestead on this land. And yet here we are, 10 years later, homesteading. So how did we get here? Well, really, our homestead journey starts long before my wife and I were ever born. Both Bonnie and I grew up in families that I think many people would have considered to be homesteaders, perhaps sometimes a little bit more so than others, but we grew up in families where raising and growing food was a big part of our way of life. And knowing what I know now and looking back on how our parents were raised, our grandparents were raised, I think that we could safely say that Bonnie and I are at least fourth generation homesteaders. But having said that, we never applied that term to what we were doing. I never heard that term used to how I was raised. Bonnie never remembers hearing that term applied to how they were raised. For us, it was simply a way of life. And when I say it was a way of life, that probably is an oversimplification. Because really for our families, when I look back on it, it was life to us. If we didn't raise and grow our own food, 
in many cases, we would have gone hungry. Both my wife and I come from families where we have large families in our family tree, uh, families of nine, ten kids. While my wife and I don't come from families that large, looking back on it now, knowing what we know now, we were poor, 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 poor people. We didn't know it, but if it wouldn't have been for the fact that our families had gardens and raised animals and so forth, I strongly believe there are many occasions when we would have gone hungry. We had to raise and grow our own food. It, it wasn't just a way of life, it was life to us. Now, I certainly don't want to sound too overly dramatic here. Uh, my wife and I had great upbringings, and obviously situations change, and as we got older, we got away a little bit from the raising and growing food. In my case, it was because my mom and dad became missionaries to Brazil. And so once that happened, uh, for about 16 years, uh, I was no longer directly connected to the raising and growing of my own food. We went to Brazil, I went to college, my wife and I lived overseas for a while. And so for about 16 years, again, neither one of us was directly connected to raising and growing our own food. But we still weren't foreigners to the concept. We had aunts and uncles, and in my case, my grandfather, who were still actively raising and growing and preserving uh, some, if not a lot, of their own food. My Aunt Mill and Uncle Ron had a big garden and were heavily involved in hunting. And so I, I was continually reminded of it through them. My Uncle Dave and Aunt Ruth also, large garden, hunters, did a lot of canning and so forth. And so I was around that. I actually spent a uh, summer with, with both uh, of them. My grandfather, he continued uh, until he was unable to live on his own to have a large garden and to raise chickens. And so, again, I was around Ray, the concepts of raising and growing your own food and the homesteading type lifestyle, even though I wasn't directly living it myself. In 2007, my wife and I relocated back to this area to be close to my grandfather. The idea was that we were going to live with my grandfather for about six months until we could find our own place. And then at that point, uh, we would try to be close to him and look in on him. But the plan was to live with my grandfather just for six months. Well, as things went, we ended up living with him for 18 months. And at the time, it was very frustrating because we had a two-year-old. And, you know, you've got an older guy who's kind of set in his ways and you're trying to Make sure that your two-year-old isn't destroying the house and getting in his stuff. And so it was a bit frustrating. But looking back on it now, those 18 months were invaluable because those 18 months really were the catalyst. Uh, they, they were really what reconnected us back to the concepts of raising and growing food. As I lived with my grandfather, uh, I started taking over the responsibilities of the garden. I started taking over the responsibilities of canning. I started taking over the responsibilities of the chickens and I found that I absolutely loved it. I absolutely found so much joy and satisfaction in getting my fingers in the dirt in watching uh, the things that I had planted grow and in, in, in preserving the harvest. I just found so much joy in those things and I had a great mentor and my grandfather uh, to, to learn from, to ask questions from. And so it was something that was just absolutely invaluable. Those 18 months that we lived with my grandfather, well, at the time were very frustrating. Looking back on it now were really what reconnected, uh, is really what reconnected me to the concepts of raising and growing food. Again, at this point, I had no idea that anybody would consider it homesteading or that there would be any kind of a movement around it. Uh, for us, it was just simply the way we lived our lives. My grandfather had always done that, and so I just kind of picked up where he left off. In 2000, the end of 2008, my wife and I bought this property. Now, again, we did not buy this with any kind of idea of homesteading, of raising and growing food here. 
it's it was about a quarter of a mile from my grandfather's house and my grandfather had at least I, I would say it was probably close to a quarter of an acre maybe not quite that big but it was a large garden spot that he had been tending to for over 40 years and applying compost to it, which is very nice beautiful soil and so for the next five years we continued to uh, work that ground and, and put in a garden there and raise it and and preserve the harvest up here at our place we put in a handful of raised beds and we had things like tomatoes and peppers but not a whole lot going on up here the bulk of our gardening was done down at my grandfather's house we continued to keep the chickens at my grandfather's house and he kept an eye on them. It was something for him to do each day. He would feed them and water them and care for them. Towards the end of 2013, my grandfather was having quite a number of health issues and it became apparent that he could no longer live on his own. And so at that point, we relocated the chickens up to our house and my grandfather moved up with my aunt. And at that point, we no longer had access to the garden spot down at my grandfather's because the next year we sold his house. Because of that, our focus really changed from raising gardens, raising vegetables and those kinds of things, more to raising meat. And so we experimented with raising standard breed roosters as meat birds, and that was a total disaster. And I'll probably share with you on another podcast how badly that went. Uh, we got into raising meat rabbits, and there's a whole story behind that. It was not by choice, uh, but we ended up with, uh, well, three rabbits that we were supposed to watch for uh, 10 days. It became 10 months. We learned a lot about bunny math, and uh, there's a whole story there that I'll share on another podcast. But for the next several years, uh, our focus really was around raising animals. We raised a lot of chickens. We actually got into ducks for a while, and another story behind that whole fiasco. Um, and so we didn't raise a lot of, of garden. We had two eight foot by four foot beds and I think two four by four or maybe three four by four raised beds. And that was the extent of it. And so the amount of canning that we had been doing dramatically decreased. Uh, but we were still raising and growing our own food, experimenting with a variety of different things uh, from the standpoint of the homesteading lifestyle. But again, still having no idea that what we were doing would constitute homesteading. In 2017, we decided to get pigs. We decided to get American guinea hogs. And as I was starting to look into how do you raise American guinea hogs, it was at that point that I discovered this whole world of homesteading. I discovered homesteading YouTube videos. I discovered homesteading podcasts. And for the first time, had a name for what we were doing. I discovered the writings of people like Joel Salatin and Elliot Coleman and so many others. Because of people like Justin Rhodes, I was introduced to the concepts of permaculture. I've learned a lot from other YouTubers like Arden Bree, like Al Lumna, Jason Smith, and so many others. Now, one thing is for sure, upstate New York is certainly probably not one of the places that many people think of as being a bastion of homesteading. And so while I was initially discovering what this homesteading thing was all about, I found a lot of community online via Facebook and other social media. One of the things, though, that I am really working on now is trying to develop community here locally. I had the opportunity to speak about homesteading at our local fair uh, this summer. And through that, that has kind of served as a catalyst towards organizing and making plans to organize uh, meetings for homesteaders here in our local area. Obviously, as I shared earlier in the uh, community corner, I had the opportunity to make contact with another local YouTuber. And uh, so that's very exciting. Again, I think that homesteading really, really thrives when we understand while we're in search, we're in pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, there is that sense of community, that interdependence that I think really is what makes homesteading shine. And so that is this edition of Charting the Course. Hopefully you have found it enjoyable and informative. Uh, it's given you a better understanding of who I am and what my journey has been up to this point 
with regards to homesteading and I'm looking to looking forward to sharing more of that journey with you over the next few weeks, months, and hopefully years ahead. And now for our first ever homestead hack. One of the things that I have struggled with on our homestead has been keeping up with everything that needs to get done around here. If you're anything like me, if your homestead is anything like ours, there are way more tasks than there are hours or days or weeks to get everything done. And in particular, if you're working an off-farm job and you have other interests and activities outside of homesteading, which I think everybody does, obviously you're trying to keep track of all of that stuff. You're trying to constantly reprioritize. And one of the ways that I have always tried to handle that is by creating lists. I'm a list person. So if you're a list person, you're going to find this helpful. I used to do all of that on paper. I would write out a list and then I would check things off. And then I would rewrite out the list as priorities changed or as new things were added to the list. And that works, but I was constantly losing my list or I was forgetting my list or I was, well, I ran it through the washing machine uh, or whatever. Priorities change and I have to rewrite out my list. I have found Google Keep to be an extremely invaluable tool. I tried out a number of different task software uh, programs on my phone, and by far and away, I have found Google Keep to be far superior. A number of reasons behind that. First of all, I was already a member of the Google family. I have Gmail, I use Google Docs, and so using Google Keep was just, well, it, it, it was like second nature. The other thing that's awesome about it is that I install the app on my phone, but the, uh, the the lists are synced to the web, and so I can look at them via a web browser, or I can look at them on my phone. I can share them with other people. As priorities change, I can reprioritize things. As priorities are complete, I can check them off. I have a record of what I completed, and so I have found Google Keep to be something extremely invaluable. It's freeware. Obviously, Google's spying on you, so keep that in mind. Uh, and if you're worried about that, then maybe it's not the software uh, package for you, but I have found it to be something extremely useful and it doesn't cost you a cent. So I would recommend checking it out to keep track, to help you keep track of your homesteading tasks. So that is the first ever Homestead Hack here on the Homestead Journey podcast. So as I close out this first episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, I want to share with you a story with regards to my grandfather. After we bought our homestead and we moved out of my grandfather's house, we would invite my grandfather up for dinner several nights a week, and usually he would spend Sundays with us as well. And one of the things that I will never forget as he would look around the homestead and look at what new project I was working on or what new harebrained idea I was trying out. As he would leave each time, he would look at me and he would say, well, Brian, keep up the good work. Now our homestead has expanded way beyond what it was when he passed away five years ago. I wish you could see what we're doing on our homestead today. I guarantee you that what he would say as he looked around, he would tell me, Brian, keep up the good work. So I don't know where you are in your homestead journey, but what I want to say to you, like my grandfather used to say to me, is keep up the good work. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.